budgetary bloodletting could be a cure for a complicated and sometimes not that well-functioning system. I hope policymakers will read your book, understand the intricacies and functions of the Human Rights Council, and base their support to the human rights machinery thus on ratio and facts rather than on superstition. In any case, I think your book gives inroads to this. But now we are not just here to you present the book, but actually we have excellent speakers, commentators with us, and I would like to, to welcome you. I'll just very briefly present all of you before then handing the floor to Eric. So first of all, yes, the author, Eric Kistunegif of the Human Rights Council branch at OHCHR. Eric is known to many of us as a writer, which explains his ease in presenting a complex matter. But even more than that, he's not only person actually who could have written that book. He has the inside knowledge, not to reveal secrets necessarily, but the knowledge where to find the well-hidden public information essential to understand the whereabouts and rules of the presidents of the council. We have then actually asked the commentators to speak well on the book and comment on, on the council as it's going and have a, <clears throat> are happy to have a, a different perspectives, an NGO perspective, a perspective from the UN and also a diplomatic perspective. So um, Salma El Husseini, program manager at the International Service for Human Rights. She's someone who knows perfectly how to navigate the Human Rights Council even though probably the book allowed you to learn even more about the source of some of those rules, I think. Uh, Salma leads the International Service for Human Rights Strategic Engagement and Advocacy at the Human Rights Council, holds a master's degree in international human rights law and a bachelor's in political science from the American University in Cairo. Prior to joining the International Service, she worked for international and national human rights organizations in the Middle East and North Africa. Second commentator will be Bertrand Ramcharan, a former UN Acting High Commissioner for Human Rights from 2003 to 2004 and Deputy High Commissioner for Human Rights. During a long career with the UN Human Rights, he worked in peacekeeping and uh, was director in the UN Political Department, served also in the Center for Human Rights as a special assistant to the director, so I think he's very well placed to share with us also a perspective of the historic development of the system on which actually he's himself recently published a book. And to uh, complement this with a diplomatic perspective, um, <clears throat> we're honored to have His Excellency Koli Sekhi with us on the panel, permanent representative of Senegal to the UN Office of Geneva and former president of the Human Rights Council in 2019. Ambassador in Geneva since 2016, His Excellency Sek is responsible for a multitude of UN and international organizations in Geneva, and thank you for making your way so quickly from WTO to come here, as this is also a file obviously you're responsible for. In a diplomatic career with many postings, including to New York and as Chief of Cabinet of the Foreign Minister of Senegal, he has surely well prepared, that has surely prepared you well for all the functions, but I'm sure as president of the Human Rights Council, you benefited from Eric's knowledge of the council in direct and so future presidents will do the same and those working in and on the council will do so with the help of this book. Um, so actually with this, I would like to hand over to you, Eric, and just for two, three modalities, so as we have uh, participants with us online as well, just to say that we are in a setting of a Zoom meeting so people can um, participate uh, easily. So later on, when we come to the discussion, I would like to ask uh, persons in the chat announcing themselves, uh, oh, sorry, persons online announcing themselves in the chat or using the raise hand function. So actually we see when you want to interact and I'll give the floor to you as well as the persons here in the room trying to be, um, <coughs> to, to be even with people online and offline participating. Well, Eric, uh, it was also a pleasure, I should have said, to have you had here as a short time uh, colleague, because, uh, well, we say you wrote this book at your fellowship at the Academy, but everybody who's ever written a book knows that a book isn't written in four or five months. So I think uh, you worked a little bit outside that time too. But in any case, it was a pleasure having you here as a visiting fellow at the Academy, then at the, under the direction of uh, Marco Sassoli, who is also here in the room. Welcome, Marco. <laughs> <clears throat> when you have the time to do a UN sabbatical, disconnect a little bit from the daily rushings of your work and concentrate on that book. 
And now over to you, Eric, please. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Felix, and good, good morning, everyone. And uh, I cannot start by without saying uh, thank, thank you, Felix, thank you, Marco, for having hosted me. And contrary to what we, you said, I, I spend a lot of time here writing this book. I was coming from the uh, very uh, hectic Pali Wilson, and the United Nations, and I had this little office in the corner over there. It was a beautiful place. It was a place where I could uh, oxygenate myself and I, I could spend a great deal of, of, of time working on this. Initially, uh, I wanted to work some kind of guide for the benefit of, of delegations and NGOs on how to approach the, the council on how to work uh, and to benefit for, for the knowledge uh, I had accumulated with colleagues for, for, for some years. But I realized very soon that it was not possible to do so in a narrow sense of the term. It's impossible to approach the council without really dissecting it, getting into every aspect of it, because mostly it's a common law system. Very little is codified. You have a few documents which are mentioned here and there, document 5.1, document 60.21, document uh, 60 stroke 251, and that's more or less it. The rest is based on precedent and practices. And the, the, the major difficulty is that it's very hard for people to get all of these documents and to get all of the practices. And I thought when I was looking into this that I should move much beyond this, that I should get into the old story. And that's what occupied me for quite a number of months. And I'm very grateful to the Jenny Barker who for having helped me doing so. And I'm very happy to have the panelists with me here. Uh, Salma is someone with uh, whom I worked quite a lot with NGOs. We have tried our best to ensure that NGOs, which basically are, are the most important element in this UN body, if you compare it with any other UN bodies, that's the main significant difference uh, which you can find with New York bodies. Uh, Bertie, with whom I had the privilege of working many years ago when uh, he was deputy and acting high commissioner and uh, I, I would say that he was my mentor, uh, providing me with a lot of uh, uh, assistance in how to, to deal with complex issues. And that served me a lot when I became secretary of the commission and later secretary and uh, chief of the Human Rights Council branch. And of course, uh, Ambassador Kodisek, who was the president of the council last year, and that was the year when I finished my book and with whom I, I have had the privilege of, of working very closely and I, I learned quite a lot. So uh, why an anatomy? It's kind of a strange title for a book. And um, this is mostly because uh, you cannot imagine the number of times I've met people in many different capacities getting to see me, asking for information about the council and actually getting to conclusions immediately. And I cannot get myself to conclusions. As those of you who have read my book, you will see that the conclusions is open. It's leaving many things to the readers. But I'm meeting so often people who are telling me, this is what the council is about. These are uh, all the mistakes it is doing. These are all the flaws. These are all the shortcomings and so on. And I basically, basically uh, scientifically speaking, are the big problems that. I don't mind people disagreeing with what the council is doing or having a lot of difficulties with its outcome or the composition or whatever, provided this is based on the sound and profound legal, political, scientific analysis. And that's what I wanted to do. And to me, the image was with anatomy because in the middle age, it was not possible to open a human body, for, at least in Europe for religious reasons. And so there was a lot of extrapolation of what was in there without having an idea of exactly what it was. And that led uh, commentators of the time to make many absurd conclusions, which I'm cutting some of them in introduction. So I've, I've articulated my book according to, let's say, what you would find in an anatomy book in the medicine. And it starts, for instance, with the, the body. And for me, the body was explaining how the, the council is actually uh, operating how it is constitute, constituted, the, the UPR, the special procedures, the commission of inquiry and so on. And I detail this uh, very meticulously, but I always try to find the issues under each specific chapter, which required a step back, analyzing and looking into it. For instance, in that chapter on the body, on the Human Rights Council, I try to see why there is so little interaction between the various human rights bodies. 
a lot of humanized bodies and mechanisms exist. We have five types of country mechanisms, we have three types of uh, thematic mechanisms, but there is very little interaction. And I try to uh, focus on this and find some reasons behind it and maybe some possible solutions. When it got to the skeleton, that's the second chapter, the skeleton, which in this case is the functions of the council, and that's a, a very major, a very thick chapter, analyze all the functions. There, I looked into what I thought, and this is my personal opinion, were the failure of the commissions. Many have said that the failures of the commission were politicization and polarization. For me, that is not the case. You cannot deal with human rights without being politicized and polarized. The question is how you deal and manage uh, this politicization with a view to get to a certain outcome and, and, and make things better. Uh, to my mind, the issues which I found the most problematic ones were how the commission dealt with serious and massive human rights violations. So I digged a lot into two cases, which I found particularly revealing. During the Cold War, I took Cambodia, the genocide, as an example, of what the commission didn't do. And I could find almost nothing in the archives and everything I looked, with the exception of one secretariat document and uh, some discussion at the subcommission level, which were not leading to any meaningful results. But it was a genocide which killed a quarter, at least a quarter of the population of the country. And then I looked into the genocide in Rwanda and into what was the response in the post-Cold War area. And there again, it was mostly uh, unsatisfactory. So for me, that was the, back, the, the background against which I wanted to study how the functions of the council were operating. And there I, I, I looked into and I built on another metaphor what I call the geology of human rights. And this is something which we discussed a lot with Bertie in, in the old days. Uh, saying that each generation, each generation of human rights activists, diplomats, NGOs are built layers. They are built something new, starting with standard setting, with special rapporteurs, with, uh, well, later on, technical cooperation, the, human, the uh, High Commissioner's Office, and so on. And all these layers, they still are in place now. When you dissect and look into uh, a session of the council, you will realize that everything which was done from the very start, it's still being done now. You look into the program of work and you see that you still have standard setting. You have, of course, a lot of special rapporteurs work. You have commission of inquiry, you have interaction with I, I commission. All this is the result of this geology and it's very much there. And what is the goal of this? To my mind, again, and that's what I was trying to dissect is to deal with very difficult and divisive issues. And the council, and I enumerated some of these issues which are quite well known from defamation of, of religion to, to the follow up to Durban, sexual orientation and so on. And the council responses to this was to try to manage politicization with a view to ensure that these issues could be discussed in normal, sensitive way getting to some outcome which would be constructive and positive. And that, to my mind, is probably one of the most important features in terms of what the Council is all about compared with its predecessor, trying to find ways and means to deal with this, from joint statement to uh, maximizing the uh, informal meetings to having a lot of uh, cross-regional community of sponsors, a lot of machinery of this nature. And that is what I think is, is, is very important to, to, to mention. I move to the nervous system. Then the nervous system is uh, basically the bureau and the president of the council. And, and uh, our guest here, the, the ambassador of Senegal, was president of the council. And he will certainly agree with me that contrary to many other bodies, the um, president and uh, his or her bureau is doing a lot, a lot which is unseen. Sometimes you have the tip of the iceberg in the room and you see that there is a, a flurry of criticism or whatever, but the bureaus are doing a lot of things from it and it is sufficient and I dissected in this book a lot of what was done during at the time of the five resolution 5-1, the role of, of the bureau in other circumstances. And one of the major example is when at the time of uh, the UPR, one country decided to step out and that would have broken entirely the universality of the system. And the Bureau of the time 
he worked hard throughout the year to bring back that country in the UPR, not in the council, but in the UPR, and it worked. So that's the role of, of, of the, 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 the president and his, his bureau. I moved to the organs and the stakeholders, and then I touched on NGOs, which I consider as really the, the main novelty of, of the system. I, I mentioned the importance that they play, an important role which has been consolidated this year in a very strange manner because we are now living in COVID circumstances and you are using a lot of video messages and so on, and that's something which is important. I also mentioned the unfortunate weight of lobbies of Congos and so on, and, and I've and I've talked a lot about this system and I talked about member states and comments which are often made on the composition of the council. And I try to direct to what is not often focused on, which is the clean slate system, which makes it impossible for a proper type of elections to take place. So in each of these chapters, I've tried to move on issue or angles which were not specifically designed uh, or envisage in general circumstances. The, 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 bill, the, the, the big part of the document of, the, of this book is mostly about what I call the digestive system. You don't ask me why. It's the voting procedure. It's actually the voting procedure, what comes out of all this. Because I thought that this was very important for delegations and others to understand why it is done in a certain way. It's extraordinarily complex. It's extraordinarily difficult to understand it. And that's why I, I really spend a lot of time dissecting everything. And I gave example of complex adoption process, for instance, the resolution and numerized defenders 31, 32, where there was no less than uh, one no action motion, 31 amendments, a large number of vote on separate paragraphs. And I'm trying to explain why it came to this for psychological, political, and other reasons. And uh, lastly, I, I worked on what I call the respiratory system, which is the change management efforts. And this is mainly the review process where I try to explain that it cannot by definition lead to much and opposite to uh, ad hoc and pragmatic measures like what the council is doing now and what it is uh, conceptualizing under the term of uh, efficiency process. And in my conclusion, I'm actually not concluding. What I'm trying to say is, readers, please uh, digest everything you have read and get to your own conclusions. And think about the positive examples, which are the most difficult to identify. But the main one is that basically the council has been able to do what its predecessor may be, I may be uh, too severe with the commission, but I'm thinking about the commission of the 70s was not able to do because of the Cold War, which is to get in depth into all type of violation of human rights throughout the world. And that is, I think, the major success. That is, there is not a single situation, thematic of count or country situation, which is not dealt with in the matter or another by the council at any of its given session or intercession. So I think that is really the main issue. The other positive element, which I think is there, is the flexibility with which the council was able to do that. And that leads lead me to something which I call the fluctua fluctuating nature of uh, frustrations. In the old days, the frustration from the general public, from everyone, from NGOs, was to say, you don't talk about these issues. You don't get to us explaining us that there are issues in so many different countries and that certain things are problematic. Now this is discussed all the time, all the time. And the question is, main question, I've listed the name question addressed to the readers is, what is happening when everything is said, but there is not much being done in terms of implementation? And that goes much beyond the council, which actually cross the Atlantic Ocean and gets to New York and to the political organs of the organization or to the other type of organization. What is happening when the council is saying that there is a huge and massive human rights violation in a certain country, and that remains in a report, which is then prepared again three months later and three months later and three months later. Same thing with themes, when we do have the same sort of um, outcome, which leads maybe not to a very practical uh, uh, implementation. So these are there are various other questions that I am asking the readers to think about and digest because I cannot reach a conclusion myself and I didn't think it would be fair 
because it should be open to actually discussion like this one. And I will stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Eric. <clears throat> Thank you for walking us through the body parts of that uh, of that book. And actually, I'm also very keen to hear now from our fellow panelists uh, their views on the book, on how the council is developing, how you see the usefulness, obviously, of the document, but also whether you share Eric's reflections of the functionality of the different parts of the system. So, Salma, first of all, over to you, please. Thank you very much, and, and thank you for, for the opportunity to, to share, uh, share my, my reflections with you. And thank you very much, Eric, for, for this book. Even though I, I work with the council uh, all the time, I did learn a lot uh, from this book. As, uh, and as a relative, as a relative newcomer, um, it has been so use, useful to read about the history of, of the council, and in particular, the information that exactly, as you said, is not, is not accessible. So how the council works with uncodified precedents in particular, it's really important to have all of this in, in, in one place. And especially now when we are seeing increasing challenges to existing practices of the Human Rights Council, having this information and having the documentation of, of, of these precedents is really essential for civil society to be able to defend these practices and really avoid um, knowledge being lost with, with, with turnover. And just one example is in the context of our discussions with the efficiency on how the council works, it's really useful to know the history and the, and the context of the different positions of groups and, and states and how these working methods um, evolved into being how, how they are, because this will help us uh, moving forward and lobbying uh, to, to safeguard that, that, that space. And what I found also particularly interesting is comparing the council with, with its predecessor, because despite all of the frustrations that we have with the council reading it about the, the predecessor actually made the, uh, uh, shows how the council is really flexible in, in, its, in its methods of, of work. And, and even um, after the COVID-19 uh, impacts, I think Eric, you would need to write another chapter about how the council has, uh, has adapted in, 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 in this context. And the book also shows how the, the council came about accumulating the different tools by giving the historical context to, to, to each of them. And in one part, and, and, and you mentioned it, the, the geology of, uh, of, of the HRC of being composed of multiple layers of contributions by generations of stakeholders who try to identify possible step forwards and answers to emerging problems. And that for me is really the, the important contribution of, of this book because it documents these different layers uh, and analyzes the process of how we, how we have what we have um, right now. And the framing of, uh, of unpacking it as an anatomy of, of, of the council, I found that very useful. And by the same time, it is very detailed and comprehensive, but the way that you, um, um, articulated the ideas and unpacked the ideas. Uh, it was not confusing, nor overwhelming, and I think it's a, it's a very useful tool for human rights defenders and students as well uh, to be able to understand how the council works. And I'll use some examples of, of, of how this uh, the information is, uh, is is easily unpacked or easily explained. So, for example, explaining the the mandate of uh, of, of the council. Um, in a comprehensive, but also with really practical information, starting from you know speaking times, how to get a badge, to side events, to explaining the different types of debates, which is always com complicated to, to, to explain to, to those who have not engaged with the council before. It even has a section where it includes every single type of meeting, both within the council, with, with, within the session and, and intercessionally. Um, also, the way that you um, explain the, 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 human, the, the different mechanisms and uh, not just calling them commission of inquiries, but also explaining how there sometimes are commissions of inquiries that are not called commissions of inquiries, which is also very useful to, to have. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, uh, for example, also special procedures, how they're, they're appointed and what happens in the different scenarios. And this is something that we always, uh, human rights defenders always ask us about, about how, how does this process happen? And there is not a place where you can guide them to. This is exactly how the procedure is qualified. So I think this is also very important for civil society to, to have uh, that process outlined in a transparent and uh, accessible manner when there are disagreements, of course, not the 
technical aspect. Uh, but also what, what, what is important about bringing these mechanisms or, or explaining the relevance of, of these mechanisms, not only say, you know, explaining that this exists and that exists, but what is the impact of it? How is that different from the different types of, of mechanism? For example, UPR, how that came, uh, how that came to happen, uh, why it's in, in impactful as an, an, an entry point and how states perceive um, the, this process. And what's also very uh, important is that the, it's not just, um, um, it explains the council not just from a perspective of a UN-centric perspective or a state perspective, but also from a civil society perspective of why civil society would bother engaging and what is the value uh, in engaging. And one particular thing that is going to be very useful for us at ISHR when we do our uh, annual training programs is you even have a section explaining the, the informal groupings of states, which we always struggle to find a documented uh, or a place online where you can um, um, give that information about how the different dynamics within these uh, informal political groups uh, work. And then also one uh, mechanism of the council that's always been very opaque, always is very opaque, is the complaints procedure. Uh, and so it's, it actually includes uh, in an annex, you know, all the situations that has been uh, that have um, that have been examined and, and where they ended up. And this is really very important because that's uh, information that's that's not accessible. Um, and then also you, you touched upon that about the Human Rights Council membership. It's true that always the criticism that the council gets is about how are, you know the composition of, uh, of of the members, but it does explain first of all the negotiation process of how the the resolution that created the council was um, was was negotiated and why uh, some recommend or some suggestions or critiques that we hear about now did not end up in, in the in the actual uh, text and of course also explaining about how uh, the issue is of course closed states uh, and non Petition. And there's even also a mention about the civil society initi initiatives that happen around uh, the council. So as I said, not only from a state perspective, but also from a civil society uh, perspective. As a practitioner, I'm very grateful for all the, um, uh, the documentation of the negotiations of the institutional building package, both in Geneva and New York, but that, that is something that keeps coming up in, in, in our work. And uh, unless you find someone that is able to, what was there at the time, is able to sit down and explain to you, it's really important to, to, to have that knowledge passed on um, and also for really important um, issues that we uh, in civil society are, 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 are always pushing for this council to strengthen. Uh, for example, uh, explaining what the procedure for human rights council presidents and the bureau follow when they receive allegations of intimidation and reprisals. So we are sure that that's you know, something that's not going to roll back, but actually we can use that to, to strengthen the, the response of, uh, of the bureau. And of course, we highlighted the important role and the unique feature of the human rights council, which is the role of, of civil society. And the section that you mentioned on the rules of procedure, I think that is really a, an exceptional job that you managed to explain a really opaque and complicated process to, to non-UN uh, audience. I personally be very grateful for, for that uh, for that chapter, but also beyond my, my self-interest to, to non-UN audiences, it really explains not just um, the details, but what is not evident, right? Like how, you know, why, why, why a state would, would resort to procedural motions for substantial re reasons, or why a motion can take up between 30 minutes to four hours to be able to, to, to adopt it. And the way that you present, the, the book is presenting that information in a simplified way, but also um, with concrete examples. So even after you read all about the technical explanations, there is concrete examples uh, to, bring, to bring the leader back to reality about being able to imagine uh, what happened and also even with, with webcast things where you, you can easily find the, um, the voting where uh, and, and you see how, how it went through. So, uh, and then overall at the end, what I also found um, very interesting is that other than you know just giving the, the reader the information, but also explaining the challenges of why you know why this works, why this practices work, 
uh, and it really, so really provides a comprehensive and, and, and practical um, overview, and not, you know, not in a way that just defends the council for, for, for the sake of it, but also um, providing examples of how these different critiques or challenges also appear in non-international forum. I mean, the example that really stuck with me, and I'm always going to use it, is when you compare um, uh, to national forums such as the Parliament, for example, when even in Parliament, procedural tricks are used to hijack substantive debate. So it really shows that it's not just about, and, you know, issues are not specific to the council, but more um, generally. And then to, to conclude for me, what is very useful um, and, and you know, how I would use this book in my work uh, for the years to come is actually the footnotes and the annexes. It makes me sound like a nerd, but it will, you cannot really imagine how it's going to save so much time to, to find that information. I mean, it's information that is you know, public, but it takes hours to, to, to find that. I mean. Just for example, on reprises, there, there is a collection of all the, the, the times or the minutes where the Bureau discussed uh, reprisals uh, on competitive elections, you know, when, when there was competitive elections, when there wasn't, by, by regional group, uh, as I mentioned, situations by the complaint procedures, list of um, uh, no action motions, the list of specific uh, country mandates that were created, panels, and even also the work formats, which is very useful so it's kind of like having in the annexes the all the tools uh, that that you can use um in the toolbox and so just to to to, to conclude i want to say that first of all it's a very important contribution um uh, as, as a source for for civil society to be able to uh understand the, the technicalities uh, and also in terms of the as i said the framing of, of really looking at the council through um through the historical context and it's it's pre it's predecessor it's uh, on a personal level it made me very hopeful that to read that for example issues like torture death penalty and forced disappearances were a source of tension during the commission, but now these are discussed uh, in, always in a consensual manner. So it's very hopeful to, um, to think that, to know that even the controversial issues that we work on now uh, in the future, this would be cease to, to be so. Um, and then to, 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 um, to conclude, I, I, I second what, what you said about the importance uh, of the council as being a space. Right, because this is the only space where all the actors are able to, even though they are, you know, they're in direct confrontation or with, with each other or have different agendas, but despite over despite the different positions, this is a space where issues are dealt with in a tense but uh, dignified manner, but you can still have a debate and engage on, on all the issues. So let's stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Salma. And actually, uh, if there is a place to highlight the importance of annexes and footnotes in particular, an academic institution of our, uh, like ours is surely the right one. So thank you for pointing that out. And actually, yes, you do give the, the hint there really to the, that practical value that you'll surely see in the trainings you provide and the trainings we provide of accessing all those materials directly. I would like to turn now to uh, Mr. Ramcharan to comment on, I think, yes, we've been speaking about history also of the Council, and obviously it doesn't also uh, just appear out of uh, out of uh, vacuum, but really with the history. Uh, so we're very much looking forward uh, to listening to your thoughts about that development and about that book in particular. Please, the floor is yours. <coughs> Thank you, Felix. Professor Sassoli, we are long-standing friends. And <coughs> I am very pleased to be here. Um, I was the first Swiss chair of Human Rights at the Institute and the, this institution is being established at the time. And so I'm really therefore very pleased to see you in full flow here and uh, organizing this very important event. First. Secondly, um, I want to express my appreciation to my friend Eric Tistone for this book. I will, I will speak to its merits in a moment. Uh, I have to do this to you, Eric, uh, because there is a report called the Bukhdiba Report. And the Bukhdiba Report was a dramatically good report in Cambodia. And so I will tell you about that on another occasion. But <laughs> and so anyway, now uh, what what can I say on this occasion that might possibly be of some use? Well, these days I spend my time reflecting on the and I want to acknowledge here my 
colleague Hamid Gaham, we worked together for a long time, and Eric, Hamid, and I, we labored in the same vineyards. So Hamid, you will give me some allowances for the reflections uh, that I am about to make. I'm asking myself, how, what is it that I might possibly say on this occasion that might be of some use? And so the first thing I, I, I want to touch on four things, what I would call the historical, the political, the operational, and the strategic. No, the historical. John Humphrey wrote a book called Human Rights, a Great Adventure. And he, after his death, four volumes of his diaries were published. And they're fascinating things. And in this book, Eric, in, in his diaries, Eric, he tells the story of how when he had to put together the first draft or elements for the first draft of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, who did he work with? He worked with a Frenchman by, by the name of Giraud. I think his name was Andre Giraud. And so the reason I mention that is you situate yourself in a line of distinguished Frenchmen and Giroud's name is somewhat forgotten. But then, there, of course, there was Stéphane Hassel who wrote the book Dancer avec le siècle. And uh, uh, Stéphane Hassel was the secretary of the third committee when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted in that committee. And then, yeah, so that you, you situate your, and I think you have done a great service to the human rights cause by presenting these anatomical analysis of the council and the suggestion sir. The historical that I want to say doesn't stop with Giraud and you and Hessel. Um, if we think about the intellectual history of studies of the human rights program, I would have to put in this order John Humphrey and his Human Rights of Great Adventure. His deputy, Egon Schwab, wrote a little book, Human Rights of the United Nations. And then at the time of the Tehran Conference in 1968, the first World Conference on Human Rights, Schwab wrote two reports called Measures and Methods for the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights. And Schwab documented for the first time uh, how the human rights program came to be developed the way that it was. And the Schwab two volume uh, were subsequently published by the United Nations in a publication called United Nations Action in the Field of Human Rights. It is a rather good publication. The last issue was put out at the time of the World Conference in 1993. So I, I'm situating your work, Eric, in the stream of Humphrey Giro, Schwell. Now, uh, staying with the stream, uh, there, there are books on the Commission on Human Rights uh, written by Jean Bernard Marie in French and a book by Howard Tully in English. But these books are what I would call scholarly analyses of the Commission. They, look at the, they looked at the Commission at the time um, from the point of view of its place in international relations. But they were not anatomical discussions of the Commission. And that is the uh, that is the novelty of your book, that you go inside of the commission. I want to tell you a little bit more about, um, so if, if, you, if you let me say so, Professor Sesoli, I brought for you, I just wrote a book called A History of the UN, of the UN Human Rights Program in Secretary, and I wrote another book called Modernizing the UN Human Rights History. That's just to stress the fact that I am now in the stage of, a, of someone who is reflecting on of course, when you reflect, you're talking nonsense a lot of the time. But if I go back to the historical perspective, Eric, I think that you, the book that you have done here um, does a great service to the, to the human rights community. As, my, may I call you Salma? Yes. yes. As Salma was saying, it's very um, useful to the human rights practitioners. And there is a, a dimension of the book, what I would call, the book has hints for future strategies that I will refer to a bit later. I may add to the historical reflections in a moment. <clears throat> I want to turn to the political. Mr. Ambassador, if I may turn to you. Uh, through Eric, Eric has told me what a great president you were. 
J'étais directeur pour l'Afrique dans le département de sévère politique à l'ONU, donc je me sens un peu africain euh, quand, quand, quand euh, je m'adresse à vous. Mr. Ambassador, uh, I, when the Secretary General at the time, Kofi Annan, was faced with the difficulties of how would he tackle the criticisms of the Human Rights Commission, I was then serving in the position of High Commissioner, and he called me in for a discussion. And maybe Mark, if I may say so, I should write up this story because I have some of the documents. The first thought that he had, can we make this um, human rights program into a UN special rights agency? So I advise him strongly against this. Then he said, well, can we elect them the way uh, we elect judges of the war court? So I said, maybe there is an idea here. And so we put up a paper to him about um, um, maybe possibly going the route of the of elections of the International Court of Justice. I have a reason for mentioning this, this background. Mr. Ambassador, having lived through that period and seen the criticisms of the commission, I have the strong feeling within me that history is repeating itself, that the Human Rights Council is now repeating the history of the Human Rights Commission in Seaforce. Uh, in life, life is not fair. And as Eric was saying, it's all political. And so um, while there are many good, while there were many good things that went on in the commission, when the United States was not re-elected on the commission, the United States waged war on the commission. And now I don't have to go into it. Now the uh, war is being waged on the Human Rights Council. And so I want to register this point, if I may, having, having witness that period, the signs that I'm seeing are very much the same signs. And there are forces at large in the world there. And now you are a distinguished ambassador. The power configurations in the world, uh, I've just been reading a book uh, by General McMaster, uh, Battle Bonds. It is a book of US national security policy. And uh, General McMaster in this book, he doesn't talk about, well, he doesn't talk about the Pompeo Commission, which seeks to revisit the idea of what are universal rights. Um, he doesn't talk about the US withdrawal from the Human Rights Council, but he does talk, talk President Putin has, has said that liberalism has reached its end. And he speaks about the Chinese and their, uh, their challenges to the international order. So now why do I mention this political dimension? Uh, this political dimension is relevant for where this goes in the future. And um, Eric's book helps considerably. Eric, you say in the book, um, at page, you have a number of positive assessments of the commission on page 350. You say that, uh, and I agree with you that there are many positive achievements in the commission, but I'm signaling, uh, if I may, that I think that history is repeating itself. Having said that, I want to go now to um, the operation. If you think about it, the story of the human rights, Salma, I'm addressing you now as a young person. I used to teach human rights at Columbia University while I was based in New York, as a, as a group. And I found myself putting on the blackboard the, the story of human rights is the story of concentric circles. At the center of some concentric circles is what I would call the principle of commitment. There is a dot there, the principle of commitment. Outside of that dot, there is a first small circle, and it's what I would call the circle of achievements. The normative achievements, the fact-finding achievements, many of the things that you have referred to, there are achievements. Outside of that first circle, there is another circle, which I would call the circle of immediate opportunities. One has to identify opportunities that may be available to make progress. And you are, in the book, you have correctly identified that the council has been able to identify some of these opportunities. And then outside the France, there is a large circle of the world. That's the, uh, 
the word was numerous gross violations of human rights. I mean, you know, uh, Farid Jafar has just come up with a book called 10 Lessons of the Post-Pandemic World. And in this book, Farid Jafar, who's a very thoughtful commentator, says, never before has one been able to see the levels of inequality that have been produced by the pandemic within countries and across countries. And why is that relevant? There is this question of how some, how will one be able to expand the circles outwards? So that is the, uh, that is the, the uh, operational and the strategic dimension. And I, uh, I want, uh, turning now to some of the action-oriented parts, I want to signal on page nine, you were speaking about universality and you are speaking about the UPR and then you make the following comment. The, the related documentation cannot yet be condensed into a user-friendly report. So now we have here the president of UPR Info, who if I may say so is my successor in that role. So Milo, my friend, there is this issue here. Uh, and this is a very important, I find this an important comment because uh, you speak about the value of the UPR correctly, but one has the impression that the UPR has not yet crystallized sufficiently. And by this process of crystallization, when I, um, I had the idea, which I put into a report before the then commission, that the secretary should publish a report on national protection systems based on the documentation in the UPR. So there are, when you say, Eric, that the related documentation within the UPR cannot yet be condensed into a user-friendly report, I'm asking myself the question, what role for OHCHR? And Milon, if I may, uh, I'm asking myself what role for UPR info. And then Eric on fact-finding, um, page 13, um, footnote five, you, you say, I'm here to do this, but I have to do this. <laughs> you say, as of 16th October, 2019, 120, here I'm just looking at opportunities where, where one might possibly build in the future. You say that as of 16th October 2019, 121 member states and one non-member observer had extended standing invitations to special procedures. Well, I'm asking myself, you know, I was the head of the speech writing service of the UN Secretary General for five years. I was trying to impress Salman when I told her that I wrote the first draft of the general piece. I'm asking myself, what is the UN Secretary General there for? What is the High Commissioner there for? This is the diplomacy of human rights. Go out there. I remember once Gough Whitman, the then Prime Minister of Australia, uh, he came to visit Theo Van Bogen, our director at the time, uh, about human rights in, in the South Pacific. And he said, go out and engage in human rights diplomacy one step at a time. And I want, I have the impression, if I made it, uh, yeah, no, I, I, want to be, I want to remain positive. Here. Uh, I think that it ought to be possible to raise a diplomatic initiative to raise the number of, uh, of, uh, of, of acceptances of this, um, of what, what you call the voluntary practice. Then thirdly, Eric, um, on page 48 of the book, you have very interesting observations. You say, you're referring to possible errors to new standard setting, and you refer to the development of artificial intelligence, the many challenges raised by the internet, bioethics, climate change, the impact of the exponential growth of modern technology on many aspects of human life, and the omnipotence of transnational corporations and, non, and other non-state actors in many aspects of our lives. And you say that these may sooner or later require systematic and comprehensive consideration. There is uh, the Oxford Handbook of International Human Rights Law, and the editor of this Oxford Handbook of International Human Rights Law, Diana Shelton, is a good friend of mine, and she asked me to do the chapter on standard setting. And so I wrote the chapter on how standards are set. And so, um, if I may say so, I wrote my doctoral thesis on the International Law Commission and the process of the codification and the progressive development of international law. And when I see your catalog here, I'm not catalog, you know what I mean, realistically, I'm asking myself, 
how can one render this process operational so that the Human Rights Council would methodically think of, uh, historically standards have come about because an NGO or a government may say, let's have a, a, a treaty or a standard in this chapter or the other. Uh, Professor Cecily, when the International Law Commission was established, they called, they asked the Great Sahara Shalotapa to do a survey of international law. And in this magisterial survey of international law, Lautapa kind of discussed the areas that the International Law Commission might possibly work on. And I've often thought that might there not be a case for such, not for a survey, but some kind of a report to the council that would help the council to think about the areas of future standards. And then finally, I'm not going to overdo this. Uh, um, yeah. The sustainable development goals. At page 77, you say that also particularly worthwhile and broadly agreed upon are the efforts deployed by the Council to contribute to the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. No less than 42 Council resolutions were adopted in 2019 with reference to the sustainable, with reference to the Sustainable Development Goal. Now, I want to say this, if I may, um, Last year, I re-engaged a little bit into the, um, I, I, I had for personal reasons, I stepped off of the international circuit for a while. And I looked particularly at the sustainable development goals. And I have a book that came out earlier this year called, um, what the hell is it called? Um, anyway, it's on the sustainable development goals. And the comment I want to make here now is, that, um, yeah, I think it's conflict prevention in the UN Agenda 2030. Now I'm asking myself, um, when I research this, the impact of the council on the sustainable development goals does not come across. These resolutions of the council do not crystallize. And so I'm asking myself, uh, might there be a way for the secretary or for someone to take the, you see actually the human rights content of the sustainable development goals are very minimal uh, with, the, with, the, with the exception of even sustainable development goal 18, is it 18 or 16? 16. Even sustainable development goal 16, which deals with institutions and this, that, and the other, it's very, uh, it really doesn't, it's not very explicit. But when you look, I looked, uh, when I wrote the book Conflict Prevention in the UN Agenda 2030, I looked at the national reports that were submitted last year uh, in the context of the high level review um, of the implementation of sustainable development goal 16 and 46 countries submitted report and there's hardly a single country in the 46 countries that are referred to human rights um, so now i'm asking myself when it comes to the uh, to the these resolutions of the human rights council how might one how might one shed the spotlight on it so that this enters the stream of uh, of discussion. So Eric, my friend, thank you very much for this book. I think the best thing you've said in this book is that I'm your friend. <laughs> so, <laughs> I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Abcharan, on that. And let's see whether you were also speaking of ambassadors and being your friend. So <laughs> Ambassador, I would like to give the floor to you to, for your comments, please, before we then open to the public for questions and remarks. So, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very indeed for us. So thank you, Eric, for uh, this opportunity and giving me the time to uh, have this whole new book. And uh, what I can say in the book is, I mean, a gift. I mean, a gift for me, but as a person of the United country, because Eric gave me the book in February 2019, just two months after I began the presidency. And then I could find the book, everything I needed to uh, design over the United States. Uh, from A to Z, you can find how to manage the hero, how to manage the meeting in Ukraine, because the big problem for the president of the United States is 
going to when. You don't know what will happen. We have many scenarios. Uh, and the staff, the bureau, the secretariat, they, they tell you, okay, we can have this scenario, this scenario, this scenario. And this book helps you really understand what to do in terms of uh, rules and procedures. It's very important. And uh, what has been uh, the way previous presidents uh, did deal with uh, these many, many issues, very complex issues in the United States. And helps you also uh, deal with the this end use also this is very important and actually uh, after reading the book i had the idea in terms of implementation someone who was talking about implementation to go to new york and uh, arrange this meeting with the, the security council because we know we knew at the time that the human rights country is important but we cannot uh, do, do the, the job uh, only here in Geneva. We need someone to take over what we are doing in New York and uh, this body, the human rights, the, the security council. And hopefully, we, we had the chance to attend this meeting with all uh, 15 members of the security council in order to, to find out how we can cooperate uh, in terms of implementation of uh, human rights council resolution. So, uh, actually, uh, I'm sure I was talking about uh, the fact that history, history is repeating uh, itself, but I'm a little bit optimistic because uh, we know that uh, human rights council is a unique body uh, that is dealing with some critical issues sometimes when the security council even is uh, quite very quiet. Uh, we just need to uh, be more flexible to try to avoid the politicization as someone said in the beginning and by doing so i think that uh, uh, we show to the world that there is a unique body here in geneva dealing with uh, very important issues uh, in the world and um, hopefully we can uh, have the support of uh, new york in order to, in order to implement uh, better uh, the resolutions of the human rights council and uh, Eric was saying that uh, there is no conclusion in the book, but I think that the conclusion is the Human Rights Council will survive. And uh, by, uh, by, by, by taking all uh, human rights issues in the world, we will we'll survive. And uh, hopefully if uh, we survive, nobody will have a chance to write a book on the autopsy of the Human Rights Council. <laughs> so thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And, and indeed, uh, <clears throat> when Eric uh, spoke about the frustration move from things not being discussed to things not being done, I think it's really encouraging to hear you taking that step forward on the link between the Council and, and New York. So on the putting output of the Council, maybe then also into action. Thank you very much for all your comments on the book, but also on the state of the Human Rights Council. And I do see that we do have uh, already questions in the chat and also a request from the floor. I would like to uh, recognize the participation online of uh, uh, distinguished ambassadors in the council, including I saw the current president of the council participating. So it is great to have you with us. And I would like to uh, hand the floor now directly to Yvette Stevens. Uh, and uh, while um, <clears throat> we look for others, please do you raise your hand. Do use the raise hand function for those online if you want to speak. Those in the room can use the real hand, no virtual mm -hmm. hands. So, Milu, I noticed this. Thank you. And then we'll get also to the question which was sent in writing through the chat. So, Ambassador Stevens, over to you first. Um, yes. Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate Eric for this book. Um, which is which does a dissection. I know it's not yet an autopsy, but it's a dissection of the Human Rights Council and the useful comparison he has made with the with the with the Human Rights Commission. 
one thing that I have to say up front is the language of this report. Having spent the whole of my life working in the United Nations, I know it is very difficult to read about any of the bodies of the United Nations for the lay person to understand. It's always full of jargon and you soon get very bored. But this one I believe is presenting the Human Rights Council in common language that everybody can read and understand. And in fact, I would recommend that similar publications are made for all the different bodies of the United Nations system. It would help a lot in terms of the participation. Also, I like the part where um, 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 Eric highlights the successes. I think usually when um, one examines the Human Rights Council, it's always based on what is perceived as the failures. And I think we have to bring out the successes more clearly. And I like that he started with this, but I would think that um, OHCHR and the Human Rights Council need to do more to bring out the successes. There are, this is not to say that there are not failures or that um, everything is going well, but it is important to bring out the successes. Um, this should be compulsory reading for every new member of the council or new observer of the council. So I'd like to thank Eric once again. When we were looking at the um, at, at enhancing the prevention role of the Human Rights Council, we benefited a lot from Eric's advice. And I do hope that the recommendations of that report would serve to enhance the work of the Human Rights Council. Thank you once again, Eric. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I'm sure the publisher will also be happy to hear about that uh, recommendation of this book becoming mandatory reading for every diplomat will include the students then also in that. And uh, so I would like to, um, first of all, uh, collect a couple of uh, remarks and questions and then I'll give over to you, Eric, and to, to the other commentators who might want to wish to come in. Um, so I did see a question on the chat, Eric, I don't know if you read it, read it too, it was about actually whether it's a good thing that the council uh, discusses situations in such a uh, I quote, impassionately, uh, in an impassionate way, whether it should not be more passionate uh, so as not to stay too remote for the understanding of a, a broader population. So we have this question. And then I see here Peter Splinter. Peter, would you like to speak also? We're in a uh, Zoom meeting, so it's easy to take the floor. Or should we write, uh, read out your, your question? Peter Splinter, if you wish. Oh, why don't you just read it out? So I will, I will then. Um, so he thanks you for the book and you have it in front of you to the comment, um, Eric. Uh, on the basis of the experience in writing your book, what do you see as the remaining principal gaps in knowledge and research about the Human Rights Council and its subsidiary bodies and mechanisms? Uh, so this question, and I think it's a question also that you're addressed. Maybe uh, some of the ambassadors are addressed with this one too or any. Uh, academics also working on the council. So this is another question I see in the chat. Let me just quickly check whether there are further questions in the chat. No, that's where we are. So I would invite also uh, further people online, but uh, now I'm uh, giving the floor to Milun Katari here in the room. I hope you can hear Milun. Otherwise, Milun, you might need to get a little closer to the microphone, maybe if you switch to that free seat in front. Thanks very much, and hello everyone, Eric. Um, congratulations on the book. Um, I, I wanted to make a comment on um, sort of the current uh, relevance of the council, uh, and particularly the, the UPR. Um, we are in the middle of this COVID crisis, and it seems to be something that's going to be with us for a long time. And you know, we talked about flexibility and other. And, and I'm wondering if you could comment on your experience on how the council can respond. Uh, to this crisis. And in, in, a, in a sense, to me, it seems to be inevitable that what right now is probably the only fully functioning human rights mechanism uh, has to respond. And we have a big crisis with the two bodies, the rapporteurs are not able to go on mission. Uh, and we have, we also have this whole history of good practices of the UPR, you know, where lots of uh, mechanisms have been set in place at the national level in ministerial committees, working with civil society, you know, even agencies, even parliaments are getting involved. And it seems to me that, that the council is ideally placed to have this kind of convergence uh, where it could play a leadership role in responding 
uh, to the COVID crisis and in responding to what kind of a world, human rights world, we want to have um, in the post COVID period. And I was wondering if panelists would reflect on how the Council can respond uh, to, the, to the crisis. And just a quick note on, on history, Bertie, yeah, I just wondered if you could also reflect on when the declaration was being drafted, I mean, was the declaration. You know, the drafters had already thought about something like the council and something like a peer review. And I think that's the major difference, right? That even though history may repeat itself, you have this incredible mechanism, the UPR, which was not there during the Human Rights Commission. And, and so I'm, I'm just, you know, perhaps over stressing it, but I think that's a major part of the council's work, which can um, play a very positive role in, in the current crisis we have in the world. Thanks. Thank you very much, Midun. And um, so we have about 20 minutes left. So I think we might only do one round of uh, comments. Uh, so also now the opportunity for people online and in the room to take the floor if, if you wish, please don't hesitate. So then for now, I would give it, <coughs> um, check that I'm not, yes, I see uh, oh, Valentina Carraro, and if it's not only the, the same name, it's a former colleague of ours here at the Academy. Uh, Valentina, please. Yes, hello, thank you very much. Um, I would like, first of all, to congratulate Eric on the book. I've not had the chance to read it yet, but I look forward to it uh, and to buy it as soon as possible. Uh, I have a question that also links to the topic of the Geneva Human Rights Platform Conference of a few days ago, which is about connectivity between UN and other regional organizations. And I was curious mainly to hear uh, what are Eric's thoughts about uh, the connectivity or potential of connectivity of the Human Rights Council to other regional human rights bodies. And also, for example, UPR and African peer review mechanism or other mechanisms. So what, what is happening right now in terms of connectivity and what is the potential also for the future? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question and indeed <clears throat> for bringing in uh, one of the main topics of last week's uh, Geneva Human Rights Platform Conference, the connectivity of mechanisms, which as I, if I may add there too was seen and it was commented by the presidents of the Inter-American and the African Human Rights Commission as a potential vehicle to actually reinforce each other and uh, bring implementation of the outcome of one global or regional body through the other one. So I think there, there were also a number of, of those points raised in that conference last week. So um, I don't see more speakers for the moment. I myself might add also maybe a, reflect, uh, a, a question for you, how you also, and you, you also, uh, Eric, but also others spoke of strategic and forward looking things, what could be done. And also where you see the most uh, promising areas of uh, positive uptake of what has been specific uh, working methods, specific reactions to the COVID situation. So what new normal could actually benefit from the current very restricted situation? But you also mentioned already, Eric, that some of the current uh, um, part of the current situation is, is even positive, shows also additional possibilities like with the video statements. So if you might wish to reflect any of you on that. And uh, so again, uh, uh, Eric, uh, could I give the floor to you first of all? Well, thank you very much, uh, Felix. Thank you very much uh, to the panelists and to the, the questions. I, I was actually blushing a lot during this, but fortunately my mask preventing you from seeing it, but I'm very, very, very honored. And uh, I feel really great after having listened to all your comments. It was a, a great endeavor when I started this book and I'm pleased to see that there are so, so many positive responses. So thank, thank, thank you a lot. Uh, if I can react maybe to some of the comments and, and, and maybe uh, including what the uh, panelists said. Uh, Bertie, you said uh, you fear history repeats, may repeat itself. And I think that it is clear that it is the main danger uh, for an institution like the council. Uh, my optimism lies in the fact that I was at a very technical level, I was secretary of the Commission on Human Rights, the last one, and I was then the first secretary of the, of the Council. And there is one huge difference, which operationally uh, makes, I think, a big difference. 
I remember that in the last years of the Commission, whenever we faced any type of problems, and this was, for instance, about the, the, the time limits for um, the, the, the speeches of um, delegates or very trivial sort of things, it had to go through what we called at the time the expanded bureau of the council, which was composed of the inner circle, the vice president, but also, but also the regional and uh, political group coordinators, which meant, uh, concretely speaking, that we were meeting almost all the time as bureau, expanded bureaus, and we were never solving any issue. At, and an anecdote, which I, I mean, always confounded me greatly was, uh, at one stage, I don't remember the year, the Bureau was so much divided on an issue like how to organize itself with a little less time available, that they had to set up a working group to discuss on this, and they couldn't agree on who would preside it, and they asked the Secretariat to do that. And to my mind, that was really the end of it. When, uh, when a intergovernmental machinery end up with the impossibility to identify someone within the bureau to, to lead a discussion about minutes of, uh, of speeches or about other issues of the same nature, how many statements by NGOs and, and, and so on. That was really the moment when I felt everything was going all wrong. At the time of the commission, everything had to be codified. Any change had to be codified. Any change had to re be written down and agreed in the plenary. And there was another case where we worked for one year on the document, which was not very, very profoundly ambitious, but at least it, 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 it provided openings on some changes in working methods. And when we went with this agreement of this document, very difficult agreement to the plenary on the very first day, one delegation raised the end and said that they had doubts with the document and the document was withdrawn. One, one year of hard work by the president, by the bureau, by the regional groups, by, by the secretariat was reduced to nil because one delegation simply said, well, we have difficulties with it. And that I think is the complete different with the council. And that I think is on purpose. And we, really, we did that on purpose, avoiding written down changes, avoiding having co to codify everything avoiding adopting documents precisely to, to not to be in these sort of situations. And the, the perfect exemplification of this flexibility and the advantage of it was uh, in response to your question, Felix. The only UN body which was able this year to operate and do everything from A to Z of its work program was the council. Why? Because under the leadership of the current uh, president and her bureau, uh, solutions were found. Uh, lots of discussion, informal, including Zoom or whatever uh, type of uh, platform was used, and eventually uh, smooth solutions were found, and eventually we have a new normalcy where at the last session in September we added three days of, of discussion, but uh, from an outside point of view, when you looked into the and followed the discussion on the UN TV, and thanks to colleagues for that, it was uh, absolutely great to see that it would have been exactly the same discussion last year. I'm not saying the same discussion, but the same type of discussion last year or the years before. So that is where I see the, the great richness, the, the wealth of the Council. And I hope, and that is a hope, that this will enable the Council to move forward uh, in, in future circumstances. The other important element which I, I would like to underline is that may be due to the fact that uh, the council composition is changing. Countries can only uh, hold man two mandates at a time and they have to go down uh, for one year at least. And that has strengthened the role of moderate countries. What I call moderate countries, or I could use many other terms, countries which maybe do not have such a profound political agenda and they are able to rally on certain resolutions, sometimes going in one direction, other times in other directions. They are not belonging to a, a very strong and strict groups of countries. And this weight of moderate countries has, to my mind, changed totally the, 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 mm. the landscape. And they have a weight which they would not have had in the past. For instance, just an example, this year, 
none of the five permanent members of the Security Council are member of the Human Rights Council. And that makes a difference because of course, automatically, spontaneously, uh, when they are there, they bring with them their uh, method of work of New York, the way they are followed and the way they follow their own agenda issues and they push this and they negotiate. Now we have had uh, situations where this year, countries like the three seas, small islands, developing states, uh, have been there, Bahamas, uh, Fiji and the Marshall Islands, very small countries, but they have played a role in certain resolution. They were the lead. And I think that this is remarkable. So these are my, my optimists. I do not, I will let's see, let's see in 10 years from now, and hopefully we will be in a situation where we will see that things are, are continuing to, to improve. Um, in, in leading, in, in terms of leadership in um, responding to the, the, the situation regarding the COVID-19, I, I think the council has, has done certain things this year. Uh, it was the only uh, decision which was adopted intercessionally in a written manner. Could have been much more ambitious, but it was difficult. And I think the virtual world at the time when we couldn't really master it greatly uh, prevented us from going much further. But I think that this is very clearly something where things can, can be done by the Council. I see a role for the UPR. It will take a bit of time, but unfortunately the impact of the COVID will be with us for a long time. Mm -hmm. Even though hopefully the uh, sanitary conditions will improve possibly in the next 12 months, hopefully so. But the economic and social impact will be there for many, many years. And this is where uh, I will broaden the response, saying that the UPR has a major role to play and there is something which is not really being used there. Uh, Bertie mentioned the reference I, I made to the fact that it's not easy to get to encapsulate the document in one single easily readable document. But uh, it's not only that, I think we are missing a lot of opportunities. And that's always my, my, my thinking when I was discussing, for instance, the interlinkages with, between various organizations and the question, question was raised, why, why is it so difficult to bring uh, all together? Uh, and there, I, I think that uh, on the UPR we're missing opportunities. There is something which I'll call, the, which I always call the mathematic of the UPR. It's, it's not, I mean, it's very easy to notice, but it's not written down anywhere. I think I mentioned that in the book. Uh, a state wants to look good when it is UPRized, and they need to approve or to support, I don't remember now the term, the recommendations. And or they need to not and not being rejecting it. It so happens that in general terms, there is an average of two third recommendation which are approved. This is much more than what the states would have normally approved, but they want to look as good as the neighbors or six countries in comparable situations. So for civil society, for the UN and the field level and others, it's an incredible opportunity to get to the ministries and say, listen, this is what you agreed in Geneva, you signed off, please go there and work with us on these things. And my, again, it's in my opinion, my experience, I'm not sure we are using that entirely, not only in the UN system, but more broadly, uh, all other organizations who contribute to the UPR could do, I think, um, much, much more on, on, on this respect. And with COVID-19, that would probably be an opportunity because I believe most states will approve this recommendation. So that's, that's a work there which can be done. Uh, to, to, to broaden on the question again on the connectivity between, that was Valentina, between the UN and other mechanisms, I would say that this, uh, I don't know the translation in English, but in French, we would use the word, it's la tarte à la crème du système. It's something which we have talked about for so many, many years. The solution in the past was a very formal one. Let's invite the representative of these bodies in Geneva. They sit at the podium, they talk. And when it's over, a nice report is being prepared. And this report is being translated into a formal document of the council and let's discuss the same thing the following year. We have a mainstreaming panel, which I think is important, but it is losing its meaning. The mainstreaming panel was supposed to be the first panel every year at the start of the session during the high level segment where 
dignitaries would meet and listen to the heads of agencies speaking about how they integrate human rights in their work. This has been lost. Uh, I'm, uh, I mean, I'm speaking personally, but I think that the, the, the gist of this has been lost and now it is more transforming itself like a, a super uh, panel, but with no specific outcome. So I think that what we need to do is to try to find a way to get back to the original thinking, which was at the start of the council and bring back something where we don't discuss the how, because the UN loves to discuss the how, but to discuss the what. What do we need to do and, and when do we need to do? What is the timeline and with a, a number of uh, elements of, of, this, of this nature? Um, I think that I've touched on, on, on a number of the questions and comments. Yes, so we'll maybe the other have some questions, questions for the others. We're coming to the close, towards the close of the session. So I'll just give one to maximum two minutes of each of you, but you're used to that kind of counting in the Human Rights Council. Um, so Salma, first over to you, please. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll be very brief, just about your, your, um, your question about how can the council respond to COVID. I mean, already the special procedures, which are uh, mechanisms of the Human Rights Council, have issued a ton of, of guidance right from the beginning. And so I think the, the emphasis now is on states to, to ensure that they are guided by these recommendations, and most importantly, to involve civil society from the designs of programs, implementation and monitoring, of and reporting to, to, to the council. And then in terms of what the council can do, the council needs to expand the society space rather than limited, because already, even though, and this is one of the, um, the ways that the council um, adapted where after, um, uh, since this COVID-19 is to provide some more opportunities for civil society to send a bigger statement, but that's certainly not enough, because civil society is not able to travel, it's not able to engage, and, and the, the key feature of, of the council's success is really that it's informed and influenced by the perspectives of the community that are affected by the issues. And so that is um, the like really core for the council to be able to address it effectively, to listen more to the society and have more space. Thank you. Uh, Bertie, difficult if I said only one or two minutes, but there was a question of, uh, I think, uh, um, uh, Peter Splinter on what are the remaining gaps in research on the Council. I don't know if you'd like to take that one. You will recall that he addressed that question to Eric this time. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, uh, in the limited time that we have, I would just like to say the following. First of all, I've noticed the optimism that is at this table. Um, including the optimism of the former president of the council. And I respect that optimism. Having said that, um, I want to say this. Uh, if one studies the Cold War and the leadership of Dag Hammarskjöld, the secretary general, Dag Hammarskjöld had a way of helping the United Nations to operate in the difficult circumstances of the Cold War. Dag Hammarskjöld helped, he came up with the concept of preventive diplomacy, with the concept of peacekeeping. And his first concept was that the United Nations should be the United Nations of four developing countries. Why do I mention this point? So that I accept the optimism. And even, uh, uh, nevertheless, um, I think that the power configurations in the world are not easy to navigate. And I think that there is a case for the UN Secretary to Sahol to help the Human Rights Council to demarcate its role. This, I, I, you will forgive me, Theo von Bowman, was, in my view, Theo von Bowman was one of the best directors in the Human Rights Program. And he has a book on how, um, during his directorship, the, one transformed the capacity of the United Nations to deal with situations of gross violations of human rights. And that was an example of what I would call the shaping role. And I, I just would say this, that I think that, and I was very shocked, Mr. Ambassador, when you said about the security, the council does things that the security council is not able to do, and that's definitely a positive. Now, um, yeah, I will, I will end there that somehow or the other, with this approach of positivity, one has discreetly to help the council to play the role that it is able to play in the political circumstances of the time. 
Peter, I ducked your question, and Milun, I ducked your question too, but we can talk about it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Sek. If I can let you also reply to some of the comments, if you wish, for some concluding remarks. I mean, just some more comments. I think that we need uh, more cooperation, more support from New York if you want to have a better human rights council. Mm -hmm. We need uh, less politicization. Although the human rights council is politics, but we, need, we don't have to politicize the human rights council. And we have examples, yes. And we need more constructive role of NGOs. <laughs> there is a, that's a big problem in the world in the human rights country. We can talk about it later, but uh, we need more constructive engagement of NGOs if we want to. Uh, I mean, uh, use uh, uh, better our time uh, if you want to um, create more less confrontation in the so you really the, 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 another kind of <coughs> participation of NGOs. This is my own view. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And in the one minute remaining, um, we had a nice question in the in the chat actually. Eric, congratulations on the book. If you have a magic one. And adopt two new methods of work or reform measures. What would it be? What would they be? One minute. I didn't read that. One. <laughs> um, that's a pretty good question. Um, well, various things. I, I think if I had a magic one, I, I would certainly look into the work of civil society because I need that. I think that they need to be reinforced and strengthened. Reprisals have to be completely overcome. At the same time, we need to get a solution regarding a large number of interlocutors which are not NGOs. Mm -hmm. And this is, to my mind, a serious problem now, which prevents serious NGOs from having the real input that they should have. And if we could find a solution, if I don't have a magical one, that would probably be uh, the best uh, possible uh, outcome. Uh, a second one, uh, I would probably also say that we, if I had a magic wand, I would look into the system, the various mechanisms which we have, and try to find a way to rationalize them. We are talking about it forever, and there are lots of solutions on paper, but the politics of it is now making it impossible to, to solve the problem. So year after year, we had new mechanisms, and it has become a litany of uh, statements one after the other, and we lose substance and we lose practicality. One minute. Okay. One minute. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you, Salma Saini. Thank you, Bertrand Ramcharan. Thank you, Ambassador Kolisek, for your contributions. Thank you, all of you online and here in the room, for your participation, your question, and your comments. And uh, well, I think just closing here from the side of the academy, I can say, Eric, uh, we need to invite you probably for a second fellowship uh, to write on the new normal now after the post COVID. <laughs> and for all of those who expected actually a stand of Elgar publishing outside to sell you the books, uh, COVID obliging, that's not possible. And most people are online, but there's a promotional code online with the announcement of that event, so you can buy it. And it's actually in hardcover, but uh, Salma, you mentioned students. I should have mentioned students as well. There's a paperback too that's helpful uh, for purchasing the book. And uh, so thank you all. Thank you again. Thanks, Eric, for having been with us here at the Academy and come back to present that book. It's really a great outcome and for us an honor to have had you here with this fellowship and engaging in that, uh, in that work, writing that book. We are looking forward to staying in touch with all of you. And if you wish to, please do join us also next week when we'll discuss with Philip Alston uh, the new edition of his book on the UN and human rights. So we'll continue the activities more and more online, less and less here in person, but better days will come here for that as well. Thank you very much and goodbye. Have a good afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.